Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and we're gonna talk about an exciting topic today, which is MLOps with containers. First, we're gonna start off with uh, some code from the book, Practical MLOps, an O'Reilly book that just was released uh, in October that shows you how to build uh, MLOps solutions from the beginning. And we're gonna take that code and we're going to deploy it to AWS's platform as a service, AWS App Runner. What's amazing about AWS App Runner is just how exciting uh, it is to point it to a repo and then you have a machine learning service that's uh, encrypted end to end and it's ready to you know, use as a microservice and has incredible instrumentation and logging. Uh, next, uh, we'll compare how you can do the same thing using Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Registry. So we can also containerize it, push it into the Elastic Container Registry, and then also deploy that code with AWS App Runner. Finally, we then go into the Google Cloud and do the same thing again. So we, we uh, uh, actually use the Cloud Run service, which is a container as a service, uh, uh, push it to production. Uh, once, it's, once it's deployed, we can use a utility to make API calls against it and do uh, ML ops predictions. And then from there, we're able to actually you know, proceed and, and have a production microservice. So uh, in a nutshell, containers allow you to do incredibly quick workflows, which you'll see uh, from this video. And let's go ahead and get started. But then it's like, well, well what is DevOps? And I think that this is a great way to to define it is that your company uh, needs to you know deliver things quicker. And how do you actually do that? Well, you have a feedback loop here where you build the product, you test the product, you release the product product to your customers, and then you monitor what's happening, and then you plan a new change, and then you go back. So really, it's about uh, what I call kaizen or uh, continuous improvement. And you're, you're constantly improving. And the reason you can constantly improve is because you're measuring and then you have automation that helps you, you build things out. So, you know, some of the benefits of DevOps here, speed, uh, rapid develop, rapid delivery, reliability, scale, uh, improved collaboration, security. Um, and, and kind of the, the cultural philosophy here is that uh, basically, you want to not have a silo between teams. You want to have people that are all working together for that that feedback loop. And so, some of the best practices of DevOps as well, which I'll, we'll talk about right here, would be you know continuous integration, which is what we just set up. This is a, this is really a foundational pillar uh, of DevOps is that every time I I push a change into production, we're able to actually test that code and make sure that it works properly. And that's the, the, the reason you do this is the bugs are quicker, you improve the quality, you reduce the time it takes to validate it. So this is a really big component of DevOps. If you don't have continuous integration, uh, you don't have DevOps. For continuous delivery, uh, this would be, every time I make a small change, we're able to deploy that change automatically, build it, test it, and prepare it for a release. And so we'll get into a little bit of that uh, in a second, but really this is just kind of, again, getting the, the mobile app to the customer or you know pushing the microservice you know into an API but but this is this is a really critical uh, component here and then in terms of um, microservices this microservice architecture is a, a way of building uh, like, let's say a single application uh, as a set of uh, small services and then uh, you can actually build around those you know those those microservices and each one has got a specific problem that it's solving so that's actually what we're about to get into is is building microservices another one is infrastructure as code so essentially the whole infrastructure has been you know defined uh in, in terms of, of of code so you don't have to worry about programmatically creating virtual machines programmatically creating virtual you know uh networking programmatically creating storage like you just use the cloud-based uh, infrastructure and you can build as many infrastructures as you want also the configuration is code the policy is code and then monitoring and logging is a critical one uh, for devops as well so you can see what's happening so we were we were actually doing that a lot with some of the the um, build systems we're looking at the monitoring and logging we're going to get into cloud-based systems in a second and, and we can see how you can actually log the output of those cloud-based systems and then also just finally communication and collaboration in order to have uh, a feedback loop you need to have everybody working together so i think this is like from a super super high level 
really a good page to 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 look at to to define DevOps best practices. The other one is uh, the Python for DevOps book kind of gets really into the weeds and, and shows like a bunch of breakdown on these these principles. But but yeah, that's what I would recommend to to start with. So but let's and, and in fact let's use some of these. And that, that's why MLOps is very tight into DevOps because that you, you're just building on top of it. You're essentially the same thing, but just a little bit more stuff towards uh, machine learning. So let's um, get back into this, uh, the, the code here. Let's kind of close all this stuff up and let's, and let's go back to, let's clear this and let's um, go into back into this project here, which is uh, MLOps cookbook. And, and so where, where does the, the microservice stuff come in? And the microservice stuff really comes into play right here, this, this application. And it is probably worthwhile to build a really, really simple microservice first that I can just show the continuous delivery of that application to, so that you get a feel for what that process is like. And um, what we can do is I'm gonna just create a new repo. So let's let's go through here and let's uh, go to GitHub and let's say um, uh, new, new repo here, we'll, we'll call this um, microservice, microservice, uh, and we'll call this one um, app, AWS App Runner runner so this microservice adbus app runner will allow us to deploy a a web service and automatically deploy it to production using a high level platform as a service tool so shows how to build a hello world flask service on adbus app runner okay let's go ahead and do this same things, readme file, git ignore, we'll do Python, and, and this will, will let us go through here. Okay, and, and we'll do the same thing. Like, I'm going to just go here to code. I'm going to, um, I'm gonna copy this out. I'm gonna stay inside of my my AWS environment here because it's, it, it's it's pretty nice. It's already set up for me. And in fact, I will CD up here one. I'm going to deactivate this virtual environment. So that's the other thing that's nice about virtual environments is I can work on projects, multiple projects, right? So this has got, I've got two projects already on here. Let's build a third. Let's just say get clone. Here we go. And then I'm going to create a new virtual environment. So Python 3 dash M uh, V E and V and we'll call this uh, app runner. There we go. Source it. App runner, bin activate. Great. And now I can do the scaffolding again. So go through here. And in fact, I could just copy from one of these other projects. Like this one is probably a good one to copy from. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go through and change into the app runner. Microservice app runner here. I'm gonna say touch, I'm gonna touch a make file. Uh, actually I could be even lazier since I'm on the same disk. And I could just do this. I can CP to MLOps from zero and copy the make file to right here. That's one of the nice things about uh, being on the same system. And I can copy the requirements file uh, right here. There we go. And now if I go back into this project, there should be a couple files here, a make file requirements file. So this is pretty good. Right, we have a make install, that's good. And then we have a requirements. I'm gonna change this to add also Flask right here. And so now that I've got Flask uh, installed, uh, I can create a, a simple Flask app by just making app.py. And then I also can just look at one of my earlier app Flask apps here. I'm just gonna copy this code. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna copy majority of this and um, and use it as a template. So I'm gonna just get rid of the, the MLlib stuff and I'm just gonna make a really simple hello world 
application, which is gonna get rid of all this. So all, all it does, this app here, is it's gonna say something like, hi, uh, I am Flask. And I, I guess, actually, I think I had a, another uh, example here. I'm gonna say maybe like change microservice. Let's, let's take a look at this. Let's um, let's do something like this. Let's let's add a let, let's add another route that that does something different. It says like hi, and then you put your name in like like this. And so, what what this would do? Wait, is this? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we it, this would just this would be app dot route, and then we'll just say uh, ho like hello name. So it's it's kind of like a, a command line tool style with decorators on top, and and then we'll just say uh, you know return. Um, return, um, and I think if I look at this change microservice, it would be something like this. We could do something like this. There we go. Uh, we can say greeting like this, and we'll just put in uh, hello, and then we'll put in whatever value you, you, you pass in like this. And then we'll just say greeting. Okay, greeting. So if I if I run this, I believe this should just work. There we go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna type in um, Python or, or first do a make install to install our libraries. Make install. There we go. This should work. Get everything working here. And now if we go through here and I say python app.py, it now runs a web service. And then uh, I can actually curl this command by opening up another um, terminal right here. So say new terminal, move this over, and then I can run the curl command to just test it out. So remember, I put a route here, which accepts a parameter. So I can say hi. Hi, John. There you go. Hello, John. If I say hello, Bob. There you go. It just echoes it out. So, if, so I've got a, a nice, really, really simple, you know, microservice. And if I go to the root, it says hi, I'm Flask, right? So, so pretty easy one to 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 kind of get working here. So I'm going to say get status, and say, um, oh, I'm going to go back to this environment here. And just add all this code into a repo. So say get add star, get status. We got make file app requirements. Let's go ahead and, and commit those. Adding uh, Flask microservice. Perfect. And then we'll say get push. All right. Looks great. We got it all. We got it all uh, going. So now that I've got this, I know how to build a microservice. You know, which again would be the foundation for doing machine learning. Let's go over to the uh, AWS interface here and let's take a look at this service called AppRunner, which is really, I think, one of the coolest services on AWS. And if we take a look at this, that um, this this AppRunner, uh, what's awesome about it is that you can build microservices like this. This is uh, I don't know what that one is doing, but let's let's see what's what is this thing? Python functions. Not sure why this what this code even does, but let's take a look at a at a main a main.py here. So oh, this is like a microservice that um, I had set up that uses fast ABI. And so I, I believe it needs to have the, the the word main potentially. Let's go ahead and take a look. Huh, this one is for some reason not working, but I'm gonna build a new one anyway. We can we can tackle that problem later. 
but I'm gonna go ahead and create a service. And then what this, the reason for doing this is so that you can deploy just that Flask app without doing anything. You could deploy it as a container, which is, which is actually a pretty cool way to do it. Or you could deploy it uh, as a um, source code uh, repository. Let's go ahead and pick this. Let's go ahead and say um, uh, source code repo. Uh, I'm going to pick the, the repository and it's going to be a uh, Flask. It's going to be the one I just set up, which is uh, microservice. Let's go ahead and go to microservice. So micro... Uh, microservice app runner there we go and now it's going to ask me how do I want to do deploy so this is where you would do something like a, the continuous delivery which is a DevOps best practice you would say start each deployment yourself using app runner or automatic so you could you could actually every single time you make a change it could auto deploy for you I think that's great now when I first would set this up though I would always recommend do the manual one first so let's go ahead and do this Let's do manual, configure uh, all of our settings here. So let's go ahead and um, uh, select Python 3 runtime. Now, notice that you could use um, you could use the app runner file or you could configure your settings just like we did earlier with the code build. Um, I'm going to say uh, pip install uh, requirements. So pip install, this is the build command, install-r requirements.txt. That installs the software. That's all we need. And then I can just say python um, app.py. That's it. Now, notice we need to have the same. This is port 8080. So let's go ahead and double check. Yeah, good, port 8080. So we can call this a service name. And we can say uh, flask microservice. Uh, there we go. And you can actually even go in here and tell it, you know, I want a couple CPUs or I want like some RAM. I can configure auto scaling as well. So you can configure how many concurrent requests uh, you'd like to have in your application. You can also do uh, custom configuration right here, 100 requests, one instance, 25 instances. Um, so, so you can actually, you know, again, kind of tweak, tweak this thing. So add a new like go, go through here and, and tell it you could spin up up to 25 instances. Uh, and then in terms of a health check, you can even tell it how long of a health check you'd like your application to do. You can give it uh, extra roles. So you could tell this service that you'd like it to be able to communicate with other parts of AWS or and or do encryption. So let's go ahead and just get this working. And let's let's go ahead and do a create and deploy. So the 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 idea here um, behind this is that this is a one stop shop to do continuous delivery. And if we get this set up um, successfully, then we can actually get every DevOps best practice that you could think of will all kind of automatically uh, get working inside of here, including potentially the ability to deploy a um, a micro yeah to, to deploy a microservice into into production. So uh, when this thing is finally done, we'll be able to look at the logs. We'll look at be able to look at the activity, right? Which are you know what state of the project is 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 in play. Uh, what are the metrics? So like, is it using a lot of CPU or memory? The configuration of the machine shows us all of the info. So really, this is what I like about the modern era of things like App Runner is it's 100% compliant for DevOps best practices. Every single thing you would ever need to do has all been created for you. Uh, and, and it even gives you an encrypted uh, route. So this will take maybe a few minutes. So while that's initially setting up, let me take a look at one that I had deployed before and let's see if we can figure out if there's anything wrong with it. So here we go. Here's a, this service was done successfully and we can even look at the logs. Okay, there's no logs. We could even go to CloudWatch and even debug historical logs. So I could say, okay, hey, why is this, why is this code not working? Can we see something? You know, what's what's going on here? Waiting for application to shut down. So yeah, yeah, maybe it's just maybe it's just um, gone to sleep. Maybe that's what's happening here. 
it, did I click on the same uh, log um, app runner application? Let's click on the second one. Ah, no, there we go. It started. So, so maybe it's back up again. Let's let's go to the service. Huh? Yeah, very strange that this thing is is not is not working. Um, maybe it never worked. Um, but, but we could also look at the metrics for it as well, and it could and we could see, you know, what about a week ago? Um, nothing. Maybe this thing would never worked. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> So the other thing you can do with 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 something like App Runner is you can just say delete. Like I wanna, I wanna, I wanna delete this thing. Uh, you know, maybe it never worked. Let's get rid of it, and then and then it's you're 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 done with it. Uh, the, the 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 biggest thing that's cool though about the the deployment process of this is that it gives you potentially an, a complete working microservice and or commercial application all in a box that that is ready to go and, and allow you to do things with it so let, yeah let's again let's take the take a second here and, and look at the different things it's doing so service created service status is set to operation in progress that's great now it's in create service uh section there we go so we can even see what it's doing so it's it's installing the software that's a good sign it's copying the code that's a good sign. And now it's starting to build your application source code. Or okay. So we got this thing. It looks like it's potentially getting closer. And let's refresh that up. Oh, there we go. There's some application logs. There we go. Look, it's now uh, running potentially right here. So that's a good that's a good sign. And if I click on this link, not yet, it, it should be available in a second. So we'll go ahead and uh, close some of these out. So I think it's very, very close because, again, if we look at the, uh, well, at least it's a service created uh, successfully. Let's refresh one more time. There we go. So it's ready to go. There you go. Hi, I'm Flash. Great. That's, that's what we build out. And then remember, that if I go through here and I type in name Bob, uh, it should work. Let's let's double check. Let's look at our code here. No, hi name. There we go. Hi name. So so we have hi. There we go. Hello Bob, and then we have another one. We we have hello John. Right, so we we've got this full working microservice, and and in fact, I can look at the logs as well. If we go to logs, we can look at the application logs, and it and it, it, it should show us in the last minute. Right, we can see there we go. Right, we can see that it was called. Uh, multiple times and and I could even look at it in a more comprehensive uh, example so this this really does if we if we kind of go through what is DevOps like we're we're hitting all of the boxes here right we've got all this stuff all tied together all in this neat little package here because we can do continuous integration with it we can do continuous delivery right because that's how it pushes it automatically to production so let's test the continuous delivery part so Remember this, we can say, hi, I'm Flask. We can say, I come to conquer or, or whatever. There we go. If I can spell conquer, conquer. This is how bad Google has, has destroyed my ability to spell things. Uh, so there we go. I come to conquer. I'm Flask. Let's go ahead and do this. If I push this change... Right, we, we this should be able to adding auto deploy. This should be able to auto deploy that change. Did I do it? Yeah, commit, get, push. And now, if I go to App Runner, the way that I can do a deploy, look at this. I go to action. Right, I could pause it, delete it, or I could say deploy. 
and then I'll just go through the whole process again. Now, the ultimate continuous delivery process would be we while, while this is working, let's set up one more. Let's see if we can get the continuous delivery to work. So I'm gonna go through here and say create service, source code. Again, we'll go to Flask uh, or, or go to microservice, app runner, and we're gonna do automatic this time, right? Every push to this branch makes a new version. Okay, fingers crossed, does this work? Uh, we're gonna go through here, Python 3, uh, pip install requirements. Same thing, Python app, everything's good. Next, we can call this uh, Flask uh, continuous delivery delivery and put this next and now that we've got this uh, created created deploy here it, it's going to go through here and uh, uh, set set this up so that every single so I in theory I could even in the future just go into this repo and not even open up an editor and I could just start making changes by using this this icon and every time I make changes it auto deploys right so let, let's let's give this a second. We've got the first one, which is the more simple one, which it, it will take a little bit of time. It'll take a couple minutes to deploy, and this one will allow us to validate the idea of we're you know we, we've we've made a change. You know, can it actually deploy? So notice when it does a new deploy, it it, it sets the service status. Uh, it says start deployment in progress. And we have to probably wait. We have to wait until this is actually in deployed stage, and it and it takes a little bit of time. And so let's go ahead and take a look at this. And we can see here. There we go. Service created. It looks like it's now doing a health check, right? So it does operation status, pull the source code, build it, deploy it. That's a good sign. And we can refresh this. And I believe that, that that started. Start now now the it's at a different phase. There we go. Pulled it operation in progress created. And we can refresh this. So the deployment is now in, 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 in progress. There you go. It's installing the software. Starting to build the project. So it is nice that I can look at every single phase of this project. I can keep refreshing. It should take a second. It's almost done here. Okay. And I guess if we're really bored, we can just, yeah, I think that this should be almost done. Refresh this. I guess we could also look at the application logs and we can look at the last one minute and it's not doing anything because it's not ready yet. I guess when it's when it's a little bit closer we should be able to see this thing going. So I think in the future, they'll probably make this service a little bit more responsive to do it like a little quicker to do a, to do a deploy. But then again, it is pretty fancy in that it could spin up all the way up into 25 instances and all ha handle all the stuff behind the scenes for you. So maybe it is doing a lot of really complicated operations. There we go. We finally deployed. <laughs> okay, so now if I go back to here, I think that this should say, there we go, deployed. I click on it. It should have a new message for us. Here we go. I'm Flask. I'm here to conquer. I came to conquer. This is awesome, right? Because again, I just I just made a change to my application, clicked the button, boom, it deployed. Now it's not a hundred percent continuous deploy because we didn't listen to the build system. Now let's wait. Let's look at the other service, which is this one. Now this, in theory, if there's not a problem doing the deployment should be able to do this. Let's go ahead and, and try this out, where if this thing's set up, it should be able to do continuous delivery. Okay, let's 
let's uh, let this thing finish here. Hopefully this one is really quick. So it's installing the packages, starting to build. Yeah, so I think it's ready. It's very, very close. This was the second one where I clicked the button that said auto deploy. Now, if this first deployment works automatically, that's a great sign. That means that, that, that we could then make changes in the future. There we go, succeeded. Then we can go here, refresh this. Does it work? Oh, that's a good sign. That's a great sign. So now, now let's, let's watch full continuous delivery and see you know, what, what that process would look like. So what we, what we could do is let's go to this file and let's add a change that says, I come to conquer. And let's add a change that says via continuous delivery, right? So, so what's going to happen is as soon as I push this change, it will trigger a message to AWS app runner. Let's go ahead and commit it. Great. Now let's go back to app runner. Uh, remember this is called continuous delivery. Let's refresh what happens. Look, it already got a message. It got a message from the build system. Hey, I want you to go ahead and do some stuff for me and, um, and do a deploy. Now, let's see if this works. So th this might take a few minutes again. So let's, let's, let's kind of let this thing cook and, and see if it works. And let's move on to like a third phase, which is that let's now do actual machine learning, right? Because we have an actual machine learning project that has code here. Uh, and uh, let's try it out. So let's, let's see how we would do that. So we would go to create service. We can deploy a container, which actually might be one way that we want to de deploy this. Uh, or we could deploy a source code repo. Um, let, let's try both, actually. Let's, let's start with a source code repo. And let's go to the um, MLOps cookbook, which is right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to first, again, uh, my recommendation whenever you're using like a complex service like this, like... Uh, app runner or a, a complete Indian solution is try to simplify it as much as possible. Like, because if you select this, maybe something went wrong in the automation. First, try to manually do it to just make sure you understand uh, what's involved. We're going to configure all of our settings here. Again, we'll say Python 3. We can, again, say pip install requirements. That's great. And then the start command, uh, let's double check this, uh, our, our code inside of the MLOps cookbook real quick. So let's let's go here, keep this here. And uh, where's the cookbook code? Let's go to cookbook, MLOps um, cookbook, there we go. And if we go into here, let's just double check that, okay, this one says app run 000, that looks good. And if I always want to see how I start this to double check, um, we want to say Python app. Okay, perfect. So I think that this should just work, which is which is pretty cool. We can just say, you know, Python app.py. And then again, double check, triple, triple check here the code. I just want to double check and triple check and quadruple check that it's port 8080. Great. Okay, we got all this. I'm a little cautious here about like just double, triple check because it's just this button that you press this and then, it, you know, it takes a few minutes. So we go ahead here and we say MLOps cookbook. Um, cookbook. There we go. And now we can go down to this. Perfect. This is all good. Let's deploy. So if this works then we're able to actually get now a machine learning prediction microservice available and we can we can actually test out our predictions remotely uh, which is which is pretty pretty cool uh, to be able to have that uh, capability so let's give this again it'll take probably five minutes let's see if one of the other services is back yet so this thing is still cooking here hopefully this finishes soon We'll let the MLOx cookbook keep going, but we'll take a look at this one. Unless hopefully this, this one is actually 
um, going to 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 run soon. Start a deployment. Pulled. Great. That looks good. Ah, succeeded. Ah, there we go. So, did it work? No. No, we did. I came to conquer via continuous delivery. So, so this is really cool, right? And the reason why it's so cool is that inside of this microservices directly, I could be working with a team of people, 50 people, 100 people, 150 people, and we're just making changes, making changes, making changes constantly, and then deploying those changes to production, deploying new machine learning models, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful paradigm to have continuous delivery that's directly tied to the code. Now, we could... Um, test one more thing here which is that we're, we're one thing that we're not doing is that we're not first validating that the code works properly and so like for example let me just show you something that we could do um which is we could maybe maybe just verify that a lint works first so if we go back to this environment Notice that, uh, and if I went, if I switch back into the MLOps cookbook directory, for example, let's go ahead and do that. Let's let's CD up here. One thing we're not testing is is whether the code itself is gated on deploy, which we probably want to do is we want to have some kind of quality control gate. And so if I go into, uh, for example, Python MLOps cookbook here, and you know, basically, if we look at this make file, notice that, you know, it, at the very least, it would be great to just make sure that the lint works uh, properly uh, or a test works properly or something like that. And so, you know, maybe one of the things that we would do is we could add some kind of like an and statement. Uh, and I'm not sure if this would actually work, but we could do like an and statement like a pip install dash requirements and then do this which is if that works then go ahead and try to um, lint my application for example so so if i if i tried this uh let, let's go ahead and try something like this let's let's say we go to to the uh microservice here so go back here and we and we do a pip install and and um, wait pip install and, and do we have yeah we have a requirements file here so let's go ahead and look at this requirements what's in here we have pylint pytest black yeah so so let, let's let's see if we said pip install dash r requirements dot txt and 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 then we use like a, a pylint type command which would be inside this make file. We could, we could basically say, look, let's just double check that our code is not completely damaged here. And, and let's do something like this. Let's just do that. PyLens. And we say app.py. Does that work? Which so basically, um, reimport flask. Hmm. So I think that this does have some lint problems <laughs> with it. So, so for example, maybe I made a mess out of this, which it says, let's fix it. So it says from five, from flask, import flask. Oh yeah, we don't need this. This is, yeah, this is actually, yeah, you're right. Thanks, thanks for catching this. That's what's cool about linting is it's catching a bug for us. Let's run it again. Uh, using an F string that doesn't have, you know, so so we could we could see other errors here. Unused request, uh, line one. Oh, we don't use request here, so we we could go through here and we get rid of that. And then on line eleven, there's another one. Uh, it says using F string does not have. Oh yeah, you're right. We don't need the F string. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. But 
yeah, in in a nutshell, you you could stop the deployment process by doing some kind of a command like this, right? Where instead of just doing a pip install, you could trigger and add a step here that says, "Hey, and let's also lint so that you know we 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 won't have a, a problem uh, deploying our code uh, to production." Now I don't know what would happen you know what the what the gating process is where how we would have to to do a lint uh, but but i believe we could do something like if we go into the configuration here where it says the start command i believe you could actually or i'm sure the build command under the build command i believe you could just fail the build and then it wouldn't deploy the new version so if you had multiple um let, let's say that you had a yeah, multiple versions of this. You had Flask continuous delivery for the development environment, Flask continuous delivery for the staging environment, Flask continuous delivery for the production environment. You could just have it fail the build to the development environment so that you would never merge it into production. It's like, uh-oh, we have a problem. Our test didn't pass. Uh-oh, it didn't work. And that way you're not continuously deploying uh, bad code into production. That's, that's one of the things that's uh, important in, in terms of continuous delivery. It's cool that we got all this set up, but you want to make sure you gate it on quality control, and that's where the CI component comes in, right? The continuous uh, inter integration com component comes in. So if we go back here, maybe this is a good place to stop for a break for a second. Is we have the MLOps cookbook. That notice if I if I click this uh, MLOps cookbook here, we we actually can now even use this as a uh, start serving out uh, production request to this. All right, so we're back here. We've done a, we've done a lot of uh, really cool MLOps type deployment uh, activities, and we have this microservice that's ready for us to test it out. And, and again, what's awesome is if we go back to the what is DevOps um, best practices here: continuous integration check, continuous delivery check, microservices check. Infrastructure as code check. That's implicit in in terms of the uh, app runner. Monitoring and logging check. Communication collaboration. Well, we, let's talk about that for a second. Where does this come in? Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the cookbook for a second. And one of the things that I like to do because I also do data science as well is I like to show the story of what it is I was building inside of a notebook and, and see this, this baseball predictions, um, even though this has nothing to do with the actual, the software part of the project, this is where the DevOps stuff comes in play. It's like, hey, let's, let's let people know what it is that I'm building so that they can go in and actually recreate or debug some of the processes. So if I go here and I go to uh, open Colab here, let's just kind of walk through what a, what a data science project would look like in terms of um, uh, you know something that would eventually go into production. So what I do in this particular project is I run this inside of a tool called Colab Notebook. You can see it's colab.research.google.com. What's great about this is I can actually create a runtime here that allows me to use GPU, use TPU, uh, whatever, and, and then um, basically uh, execute cells here or train uh, models. So it says you must be logged in. Okay, let's go ahead. We can sign in. Let's go ahead and leave leave it temporarily. I'm gonna go ahead and log into my account and uh, go through here. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, authenticate. All right. Here we go. Here. Great. And and next, uh, we we can we can actually start to walk through this cell now. A couple of things I'm going to point out here is that um, when I'm teaching data science at a university, for example, I recommend to people that they have four phases of their project: an invest ingestion phase, uh, exploratory data analysis phase, uh, a modeling phase, uh, and then a conclusion phase. And so this I use that same 
methodology and look, I can kind of go through here and navigate any of these sections uh, of the project. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a shift return and I'm gonna run this uh, project and, and I'm going to um, you know, show, show the name, the team, position, the height, the weight, and the age, right? They're all collective, collected right here. And what's, what's awesome about the position is that it shows me you know, more descriptive statistics about what's happening. Maybe I could dig into that into more details. But notice that there's a few things that are annoying here that I had to clean up. There's the height in inches, the weight in pounds. Uh, but what I would have to do typically when I'm starting a project is uh, do the df.shape command, right? So I make a data frame, I pull this in from uh, a GitHub repo, and then I see that there's 100, I'm sorry, 1,034 cells, uh, and there's six uh, different columns. Now, if I do this command, I say df is null values.any, it says, yeah, yeah, we, we, we um, uh, have noticed that there are some uh, values that are true here. And then if I want to drop things here, I can say, hey, do I want to drop a value? It's, it, it's uh, yes, I do. And now I can do the shape again. So the idea here is I can clean up my data and show people exactly what I did to clean it up because maybe they want to do it in, in a different way. And then I also maybe want to rename the columns. And this is really common is somebody gave you some columns that are different. In this case, these look great. We'll rename these columns. And then for exploratory data analysis, we can go through here and we say df.describe, perfect. And then, okay, what about positions? Okay, there we go, df.group by position. And now we've got this all cleaned up. So somebody can actually re re retrace all the different steps that I did in my data science project, uh, which, is, which is awesome, uh, by going through and looking at my notebook. So this would be the, the collaboration stuff. Also, you may want to go in and do more, right? You want to maybe take a look at uh, the um, a scatter plot of the weight and the different positions here. Uh, maybe even do a faceted plot. And this is something I like to do. I'm using the uh, matplotlib uh, to help me here with Seaborn. And what I do is I pass in the data frame and I say, look, let's, we know that there's different positions in baseball. Let's actually plot a plot for each position. So let's segment uh, the population and, and then let's plot the weight and height. And look, we see that the catchers are definitely beefier, right? They're, they're really, you know, big, big people. The first baseman is still pretty big. And we even have some outliers, like look at this first baseman is huge, right? 260 pounds. But if we look at the, the positions that are speed positions, like a, a second baseman, Look, we've got like really kind of lean and, you know, kind of, you know, very, very athletic uh, and quick shortstop as well, like very lean position. Nobody's uh, even goes over 220. It's, it's pretty abnormal for that. But really, we can see that there's a lot of people maybe around 180. And then if we look at a third baseman, this is more of like kind of the average of everybody. And then outfielders uh, also are more kind of average. Uh, uh, and then we also have designated hitters. So the designated hitters are typically the largest people in baseball, uh, right? Th because they don't necessarily have to play defense. They're they're very offensive and and maybe don't run that much. They just lift weights and and maybe eat a lot of food. They're going to be bigger and and pitchers as well. Like right, there's there you can see here that there's there like pitchers are are kind of an ab abnormal position because. There, there can be really large pitchers, but also there can be small pitchers. I mean, it's, it's a, a spectrum here. So we've, we've got a lot more information where if I was in production and I'm debugging someone's system, I'm like, what is going on here? We don't know why the customer is getting this record or whatever. It's nice to have a notebook that I can look into the thought process of the data scientist that created the project. And now if I go down, I also can show someone how I modeled it, right? I can go through here and I can say, hey, from scikit-learn, let's go ahead and, and uh, do the train test split. Let's do a scalar. Let's go ahead and look at the shape. In this case, we, we know that there's 1,033 rows. And then um, we also go through here and we look at the shape. Here we go, 1,033. And uh, there we go, we look at the, the Y shape. Now, typically, 
you'll then go through here and use like a standard scalar and actually convert uh, the values that are human readable into something that's more like between zero and one so that essentially the you're, you're comparing apples to apples you're you're comparing the same metrics the same um, yeah metrics to the same metrics uh, and then we also do the same thing to the y we transform it and then I can print out the split of the data because when you train a machine learning model you want to actually take some training data, which is maybe 80% of your code or 90% of your of your, your I'm sorry of your your data, and then hold out a little bit so that you can validate later that your prediction is accurate. We go through here, we fit the model. So we say from second learn dot linear model import ridge, and and notice here that I make an instance uh, of that linear model. Uh, I go through here and I say test shape, uh, prediction shape, and then. Uh, I actually show the process, like really the round trip feedback loop of of how I would do a prediction. I could even plot the predictions as well, right, and see uh, basically how they look, and then even even go through here and, and look at it in a graph. I could print the accuracy right here. Here's a model dot score, uh, and then I could also show this is really I think an important part of of doing ML ops as well is could I export the model to disk and kind of show someone how I did it? Like, what if I made a mistake, right? If maybe I'm doing some kind of export process that's unideal, uh, someone could look at the history of what I did and say, hey, you know, I wouldn't do it this way. I would do X, Y, Z. I, I would do maybe put the model into Amazon S3 or I would whatever it is. And then also verify that, in fact, after we do this, verify the model import feedback loop right there. And there we go, df.tail, we, we can uh, verify that it works, get one observation and only get the weight, right? Go through here, scale it, import uh, the whole process and then predict uh, my, my, my um, look at the unscaled prediction versus the predict prediction. So the, again, the reason for all these little steps here is that I use all this stuff later in my library. I learn it, use it in my microservice. And so it's a great communication method uh, for me to to work with you know my my machine learning team now also if we go back to uh, our project here let me just go back to we got a lot of windows open i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to github and leave all this alone and go back to this and go to the ml ops cookbook here ml ops what what's nice about this uh, is that that again checks the box like for what is DevOps? We've got now everyone, every single one of these ones, and, and the only thing different we're doing is we're using we're, we're using machine learning, but is applied to the, the DevOps best practices. And I think that's a good way to reason uh, about what what's happening. So let's let's get a little bit further now that we we tackle the communication stuff. Is that uh, remember that this app runner application, which is this one. Here's the URL for it, right? We can click on this, but we can now serve out predictions uh, by by actually going to a terminal like right here. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's 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 go let's CD up here, and let's go to uh, M, uh, M, Python ML Ops Cookbook. Let's deactivate this in virtual environment. Deactivate. Let's source the. Um, uh, what is what's in here? We have uh, ML ops. Oh, we don't even need. Oh no, I, I guess we do need this. We need. Um, I can look at the history, and let's look at. Uh, so this is one thing that I like to do sometimes. It's if there's lots of virtual environments, I can I can do this. I can say history grep source right so look for every time i sourced and so in this particular machine uh i think i must have done everything inside of app runner okay that's fine we can just source that again so so let's just in fact i can just run that command i can just say uh, exclamation point six like this uh no it's 42 line 42 so this is equates to line 42 right here. Let's use that again. There we go. And then if I 
uh, want to uh, test that production endpoint, notice that I have this command line tool that I haven't talked about yet, which is utils.cli. And what's cool about this is, is I, I can use it as like a, a, like a utility belt, right? If you remember the old days of Batman where he had the utility belt where you could pull all these different, or James Bond or something like that. It, same thing, you build this little utility belt that does a lot of different things. So one of the things it could do is if I said, um, here I go utils CLI and I do help, it tells me all the different things that I can do. It's, uh oh, no, no module named NumPy. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and, and do a make install. Let's make sure we have all the libraries here. <clears throat> and once it's installed, then uh, I can actually do things like retrain the model. I can make predictions using the command line tool. And it's just essentially an entry point for me to explore more and more about what I want to do with the model. So let's go through here. Let's do help. And notice it says that this particular command line tool can do a prediction or it can retrain the model. So let's, let's try the retrain real quick. Notice what I do is I say, maybe I'm building a tool for the machine learning team. And uh, again, we want to try to try some new ideas out here. Uh, all I got to do is do this, I just say uh, retrain, and then I just say dash dash T size, and I say, let's let's train with like a little more test data left out. What happens, there we go, and we, we can see the retraining accuracy, and then it puts a new file on disk, so we can even see this, right? If I go through here, look at the, um, the, the model.lib, job lib, right, like, that this is this has actually been modified right right now right where all those other files are are earlier modification date and so if i do it again if i retrain this with even more there we go so it's a different accuracy it's actually uh i believe a little bit better and if i look at this we can see that look i just i made the change to the file again so so basically i could just explore what happens Wow, model accuracy gets um, even better if I re if I hold out more data. So so maybe yeah maybe uh, uh, maybe have having the the training size you know be be a little bit bigger like this is a is a good idea. But what happens if I go back to the original? Well, actually now the now the accuracy gets a much much better. What happens if I just hold a little bit out? If I say 0.01. We, we we actually don't get uh, good accuracy. Like there 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 there's there's something kind of strange happening here. But anyway, you get the idea. You can you can keep training, play around with the model. What's the other thing that it did was it can do a prediction. Now if I do predict dash dash help, this is where the app runner comes in. Let's see, uh, predicts dash dash help, and, and notice that. It says sends a prediction to an ML endpoint. So not only can it do it locally, but look, it can query a specific host. And so this really does come in handy because hey, I have a host. The host is up here, right? It's this. It's this URL. So um, if I go back here, I can I can basically say uh, I could ex actually even put it into a shell variable. So I could say export host equals like this. And just put that into a shell variable, which is which is pretty cool. But the couple things to remember would be: let's just look at the source code here, and let's look at how I do this. Uh, yeah, see now, notice it, it's it's expecting to have a predict here, so I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna say predict like that. So basically, I'm gonna export this variable. Let's double check it. Let's say echo dollar sign host like that. There we go. So we got a full uh, endpoint here that I can actually do a prediction with. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, now serve out a prediction. So I'm going to go through here, do predict, and then let's pass in dash dash host. And we'll do the host will be dollar sign host, right? Because I created a shell variable. And then we can do dash dash um, weight and we'll do 200 pounds. There we go. So what's awesome about this is that I'm now able to use my production microservice that's running 
inside of uh, AWS App Runner and, and, and do predictions against it. Now, that's kind of cool that we can do this, um, but it's even more cool that I can now look at what's happening in production. So let's go back here now and let's click at the click this link here and let's look at the uh, logs for the application logs because again remember this is part of devops best practices we click it click on the devops best practices hey here we go we got this running here let's go to view and cloudwatch and now let's look at our logs and if we click on these logs notice that here we go here's my uh, here's my JSON payload right there. There's my second JSON payload right there. And, and, and it, this is really awesome is that um, I'm able to actually look through all of this, uh, you know, the, the server side code and see what's happening. We can even look at log insights here, which is kind of cool. And so if I run a query, we can say, um, let's see here, let's look at a log group. We want to look at um, Imalov's cookbook. I believe it's going to be this one. Right, we, 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 can do some, we can do some queries this way. You can also look at the metrics as well uh, inside of here, like app runner metrics, um, instance metrics. So if we go through here and we look at Imalov's cookbook, memory utilization, CPU utilization, right? Um, these will all be great things to put into a production uh, interface. Uh, we could also uh, look at application monitoring. So I believe if we go here, you could actually, uh, if you have services set up, you, you could actually create like a service map that traces the whole life cycle of your application. Um, and then in terms of insights, uh, you could also look at, you know, I believe application insights here, and we can say uh, add application, account-based application, you all the resources in this account, resource-based. Uh, let's go ahead and do this, and we'll just call this, um, no, we want to do the other option. But anyway, the, 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 the main idea here is that you can you can basically add really extensive mo monitoring and logging, which is which is critical be because that there's so much stuff that's happening in, inside of uh, an MLOps application that this is really just a, a super helpful component of that. The other thing uh, as well is you can also look at a more uh, simplified version here as well, right? So if, if I wanted to potentially give this a little bit more of a payload uh, here, what, what I could do is I could actually, I could actually kind of have a little bit of fun. And I think the watch command, yeah, it works, right? So I could do, I could go up arrow here and just do the watch command. And this is kind of a cool command to do is you can, the what, what watch does, it'll just run the same thing over and over again. And it'll just run it, right? So I can just be like, hey, let's just kind of hammer this microservice for a little bit. And, and now, I can go back to this thing and I could in theory even look at the uh, application logs here and just tail them in real time and you should see it just getting hammered right with 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 my call and not not hammered but like here we go right so we can see resume it's going to auto retry that look every time every time the the service is called right it's just calling over and over and over and over and over again uh, which is kind of cool so i can kind of test this out and play around with with this um this 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 web service and maybe maybe look at if if i can get a little bit more of um uh, monitoring here built into the metric so if, now if i look at this it should look a little bit different so if i want to look at uh, maybe one hour service metrics here it should look a little bit different in terms of of how often it's gonna it's gonna get called uh uh, yeah, and so so in a nutshell, there's a lot of little tricks you can do here, like you know, hit hit it over and over and over again to kind of wake up and see what are the different um, microservices that are working. But in, in a nutshell, 
this app runner, in my opinion, combined with something like, uh, you know, a, a microservice is just a great way to to build out code. So let me let me clean up a couple of these things. So this one's already working. Let's delete this one. Uh, this is always a good idea to clean up the work that you've done. Since we're starting to get towards the end here, I'm going to go ahead and clean this one up as well. And the the other thing that we could try as well is that we could try to push a container to the AWS container registry. Because if you remember, when you say create service, remember it says container registry right here. And it actually asks for a container image uh, URI. And, and so what's neat about this, every time I push, if I wanted to push a new container, you know, to Amazon's container registry, which is called ECR, that it would redeploy the new changes. So that's that's a pretty useful style as well. So so let's first go to the container registry real quick. And let's go to ECR. There we go, Elastic Container Service. So, uh, no, not, not, I'm sorry, not Container Service. We wanna go to Container Registry. We, won't, we wanna go to ECR uh, Container Registry right here. So Fully Managed Docker Container Registry. If we go to this, I've actually got some things already deployed to this container registry, but let's go ahead and do it ourselves from scratch. I'm gonna delete a bunch of these so I can redo this. Go through here, there we go. Go through here, delete, delete these. Delete this. Okay. There we go, delete this. Okay, so so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new container registry. And again, the idea behind a container registry, let's just take a look at this real quick, is you write your code and package the code together as a Docker image. We saw that earlier, it makes it so that you don't even have to have the code anywhere, just you get the image, pull it down, run it. And then if you push it into ECR, you can run it in all these other locations, including App Runner. they don't even have App Runner because it's so new. Why would you want to do it? Fully managed, secure, highly available, simplified workflow, public collaboration. And also you could actually um, do security scanning on your containers. That's like a really awesome component uh, of what you can do as well. So, so let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and create a new one. We'll create a private one. We'll call this MLOps. And then we want, you could scan uh, on push, which is kind of cool. Like, um, it, which it'll actually scan it for vulnerabilities, which is which is really a, a huge advantage of, of the containers. Now that I've got this working, all I need to do is uh, I can click on it and it'll say view push command. So we, we need to push a container to this registry. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's copy this. Let's go back to MLOps. Let's, let's go back to this repo and uh, and 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 run this okay um there we go. let's close all this so so the first thing i do is i authenticate the next thing i do is i'm going to build a container here because we have a docker file that's all i need which is this thing as long as i have that docker file we can deploy it so we'll, we'll run the next one docker build ml ops great Okay, that looks like it's wrapping up here. Okay, perfect. Next thing it's gonna want us to do is it says after the build completes, tag your image so you can push the image to the repo. Let's copy this. There we go. Push this, tag the image. Next up, go here and then push this in. There we go. And, and, and that's why I use a larger image. So if you are gonna be building containers on AWS Cloud9, I would recommend 
that you do go ahead and uh, build um, with with cloud nine here so we're going to go ahead and push this push this and uh, let's go through great and, and now uh, that I've got that cook, cooking let's go ahead and um, and uh, I think I did I just I just pushed docker push let's double check here yeah we, we got this push to the container registry so so if I go back to this there's nothing here now I refresh it'll show up there we go we got to the container push now let's see what size it is it's 149 megabytes so it's so pretty thin because I used the uh, a smaller uh, base image we could in fact scan this I guess look let's go ahead and scan it let's go ahead and take a look there we go so what's cool again about this is that it'll show us what vulnerabilities are available so this is an enhancement over a traditional non-container based workflow is that it'll show us what vulnerabilities are actually available um, you know by you know by by actually scanning the image where you can't necessarily do as much of this with you can do some of it with just traditional code because this is the actual runtime so I've got I'm able to test every single component uh, for security or, or at least a lot more of the components for security because the runtime is packaged inside of here that's a really really cool part of the process here that um that that you can you can take care of there we go so this this looks good um and now that i've got this thing cooking we we'll go ahead and refresh this look look at this uh-oh we got some vulnerabilities here what's going on let's take a look at this uh-oh there's a high high vulnerability package glibc this mq notify function in the c library has after use free it may use um, so basically at the C level that, it, you know, it, it has some really crazy stuff here that, that we may need to take a look at. Also the, uh, uh, you know, this other C library may have some things to take a look at. So we've got a bunch of potential problems in, at the container level that, that might be worth investigating and they're, you know, either low or high. Uh, so, so it's, in, it's interesting that we can actually get really into the weeds here and look at things like even the runtime of the container itself. So now that I've got this though, how would we deploy our, our machine to, to production? Uh, all I would need to do is, uh, now that I pushed it, I can leave this alone and I can go back to App Runner. We can go to App Runner right here, AWS App Runner. And uh, we can create a new service and we're going to now use our container registry. So container registry, Amazon now it says enter a URI to an image or browse to images in your account. Okay, let's browse. Let's see what will we'll show up. MLOps. Oh, there we go. Right, because I that's the one I have in there. We can do a manual deploy. Um, uh, we use existing. This rule gives App Runner permission to access ECR. Uh, let's create a new rule. Sure, that looks good. And then for the service name, we'll just call this um, ECR ML Ops. Leave everything the same. And, and we go ahead and create and deploy. So, uh, oh, this role already exists. Okay, well, we can, we, can, um, we can fix that, which is edit this. Let's use an existing role. There we go. And we'll go ahead and push next and deploy this this change. That looks good. And there we go. So so now we have a second. And look at this. This is pretty pretty neat. As I click back here, and it, and it shows me, hey, I'm deploying this this particular ML ops based container, and, and actually it's directly linked in, into my repo, right? So so this is a this is a really cool. Um, process that I'm able to actually deploy a container. Now, I, I am curious in terms of, you know, the, the length of time to deploy. In theory, you should be able to deploy this containerized version much, much faster because of the fact that you're able to, to um, use a container because containers can start much, much quicker than other code. So we could, we could again, kind of take a look at this and, um, and, and, and see, 
you know, see how this works. So let's go ahead and, and do this. And we'll kind of let this thing cook here. So so we're, we're getting close to the to the end of the wire here. Um, this will take a second to deploy. We only have, you know, maybe 20 more minutes or so left. So what so what I what I will say is I'll, maybe maybe we, we can do some questions for the because we've been talking about this stuff for a while. Let's let's let this thing. Uh, where's App Runner? Let, let's let's let this thing deploy here. And, and and if you have questions, this is probably the best time to answer them because we've covered pretty much everything I want to cover. The one question I have from somebody here is, hey, I have a question. Do you have any reference material if I want to implement MLOps on other clouds such as uh, Google Cloud or Azure? Yeah, great question. I do. If we go back to, so let's just let this thing go and I'll come back to it. So if we go back to uh, GitHub here and I go back to the MLOps cookbook, this particular recipe, uh, th this repo that I've been using will actually have things for all clouds. So for example, MLOps cookbook, uh, if you wanted to deploy to other environments, all this stuff works fine. So Cloud Run is a great one. So let's let's take a look at, uh, scroll down here a little bit, that if we want to deploy to Lambda, I put a document, I put a, a version there, which is obviously AWS. If you want to deploy to GCP, um, this I would recommend doing Cloud Run. And so what, what's, what's fun about that is that we could go to just just do this real quick i think we have some time gcp cloud run the the hollow world it, it should take a second to do this is um we just need to look at the documentation here to 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 do let's say cloud run gcp cloud run and container with cloud run flask Let's just let's just pull this up real quick. Here we go. Cloud run documentation. And we can just follow along or just do it real quick. There we go. Deploy. Okay, so so before you so we, we could basically follow this manual here and, and actually deploy this into production uh, very, very, very quickly. So what I'm gonna do as and again I'll just pass this should work very, very similar. So I'm going to um, just follow this real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it in a, another window. And then I'm going to go to GCP. And let's just try it out. All right. Let's see. GitHub. And again, go. I'm sorry. Con GCP console. GCP console. And let's see if we can get this to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to potentially um, make sure I have a project selected, which I do. I have a project selected right here. And then I'm going to um, open up a shell. So remember I mentioned Cloud Shell. Just click this Cloud Shell. And then um, what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to... I need to push my, I need to pull my, my app in here. So, so I'm going to go back to my source code real quick to this MLOps cookbook, cookbook. And I'm going to pull this down. I might even have it locally already down here. No, I don't. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to clone this copy. So get clone right there. There we go. Yes. Oh, that's annoying. Is there cloud shell ephemeral will be deleted? So I need to create an SSH key real quick. SSH, uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. Key gen dash T RSA. Let's try this out. Let's go ahead and do this. And then go here. So let's go to GitHub. Add this key in to GitHub and go to settings. 
SSH and GPG keys, new, we'll call this GCP. All right. And now go back again to my shell, which is right here. Clone this, great. And then I can just do a virtual environment, ENV, tilde V and V, source it, <clears throat> source V and V, bin activate, great. Now that I got that set up, I can CD into the repo, make install, make all, right? Test it, install it, lint it, all that stuff. While that's while that's going, I'm gonna double check the documentation. I think all I need to do is if it, because it has a Docker file, I believe I just say G Cloud Run Deploy. I believe. Let's double check here. It, it, it may be that simple. There's a command line tool that just says literally G Cloud Run Deploy. Do boom, and it just deploys the application. Um, so let's double check if this works. Okay, so now let's run G Cloud Run Deploy. Does this work? To deploy a container, use image, right? So basically, um, I believe it'll just it'll just figure it out. So we'll call that. Yep, we want to authorize it, and then we'll just say I don't know US East one. To make this default, yeah, let's see, not enabled. Would you like to enable it? Yes, we would. Enable in this service. Permission denied. Registry access is required. Please enable billing on this project. Well, that's what I get for not trying a project in a while. Um, Hmm. Do cloud run two. Let's try this one. Let's let's um, let's double check. Let's switch projects. And make sure go to project selector. I should be. Yeah, I might have to open up a terminal again. So that it, yeah, there we go. And then let, let's just kind of let's let's see. Hopefully, this one, the 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 billing is enabled. If not, I'll I'll say it. Look, it would have looked like this. But but if I go to uh, Python ML Ops Cookbook and I say source uh, V and V bin activate, and then again G Cloud Run Deploy, does it work? Next time. There we go. US East 23. Yes. 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 There we go. So so basically it's trivial to in, in some sense it's even easier on on the Google Cloud platform to deploy a containerized application because of the fact that um be, because of the fact that it's just Google has a pretty good container deployment service and it says API artifact registry not enabled uh, on the project. Uh, would you like to enable and retry? Sure. Let's re let's enable the service. There we go. It's building this out. And so we can and again, we can use all the tools that I had set up before that are that are pretty pretty slick here in that we can use that utils thing to change the url and we can we can test all this stuff so we've actually got this thing deployed to two different environments that are very very similar it, it, which are like containerized uh or pass type uh environments so let, let's uh, let's try this thing out this again i think it's very very quick actually let's now now while this is going um I'm going to to look at the container registry. So let's look at the registry. 
artifact registry, no container registry. And oh, it's, it's they, boy, they gotta name everything different on Google all the time. So let, let's take a look at this. And there we go. There's our cloud run source. Check check that out, right? So that we just pushed that a minute ago. And then this artifact registry, we see the format is Docker. This looks good. And uh, it's building the container. And then the part that's cloud run, we can even take a look at that. We can just find cloud run, cloud run. There we go. Hello world. There we go. There's our hello world service. And look, allow, it allows unauthenticated requests. Right, so we can do um, API calls to this thing. And uh, there we go. Here's our endpoint, right? So this in theory, I could double click, or I could just click on this. Does it does it deploy yet? Once it's fully up, there we go, hello world. Um, what is weird though? Wait, that's, that's an old one, I think. We, we haven't, there we go. That's the new, I was like, that's an old, microservice that I had set up that I deployed at some point. But this MLOps cookbook, let's, let's take a look at this. Let's watch this thing get deployed. This resource is public. Sure, that's okay. We want that. Uh, this, is, this is working. Last deployed just now. So let's, let's let this thing um, set up. But yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward for, for this is as long as you have a, a Docker file and you've already you know, tested your project out, it's one command to deploy your code to production, which is, which is pretty incredible in terms of the way Google Cloud works. Um, so there, there's Google. Azure is kind of similar as well. If you look in the GitHub repo, that um, my, my GitHub repo, there, there are some Azure examples as well that, that are very similar to this and like different projects would probably be one of the best routes. Okay, there we go. Look, we have this thing. Let's go ahead and click it. This should show us, um, no, we don't wanna kill this yet. There we go. Now now let's go ahead and, and um, let's use that utils command, remember? Right, let's, let's go ahead and say echo host, right? Like I did before, let's say echo host equals, and let's put this in there like that. And then say echo dollar sign host because we didn't export it. We don't want to echo, we want to export. There we go. Export this, export uh, like that. And then we want to echo host. Perfect. And then from here, um, I can now use that util, right? I can say utils CLI. Remember dash dash help like this. And then we can say uh, predict. And, and, and notice that, it, that we need to give it the host now. So we need to say dash dash host. Uh, and we say dollar sign host. And then we say dash dash weight is equal to 200. There we go. It says no method. Uh, oh, because we probably messed up the host here. Let's let's go ahead and, and fix this. There we go. So let's go ahead and clear this and let's double check the export again. See what I messed up here as I didn't do predict like that. And we'll do the prediction. And now let's export again. There we go. Now we've got a working service.